So having done that, we next have to turn to the question of how different sensory inputs are encoded. What is the nature of the signal that's forwarded up to the brain? And there are really three parameters or three components that have to be encoded. One is what is the sense that's being transmitted? Are we talking about sound? Are we talking about light? Are we talking about taste or what have you? The second is how long does the stimulus last? And the third is how intense, how strong is the stimulus? And each of those is separately encoded. The first of these is called stimulus modality. That is, what's the nature of the stimulus we're dealing with? And the answer to that one is very simple. The signals that are flowing along your nerves, wherever they're going, all look alike. So whether it's taste, sound, smell, or what have you, in every case, the signal looks just the same. It's an electrical signal called the action potential that we'll turn to in a moment. So if this is a spinal cord, we would have in my spine right now information about pain in my left knee from running this morning, sweating in right armpits for obvious reasons, the position of my left thumb, wiggling my left big toe, and so on. All of those run in particular nerve fibers in particular places in the spinal cord. But if we tapped into any one of those nerve fibers, the information would look just alike. So the key thing is how these different nerve fibers are connected, that they are connected appropriately at each end. That's what determines the significance of the information. And it's just like a telephone wire. A telephone wire is carrying all kinds of different traffic in both directions. But particularly these days, when the information is digital, it all looks like. It's, it's all ones and zeros of one stripe or another, regardless of whether it's trivial in importance or much more important. This, in fact, is called the doctrine of specific nerve energies. It was realized about 1850 by Johannes Müller that the nature of the nerve signals was constant throughout the body, and the connections of the nervous system were key in determining what significance a particular piece of information might have. Now, the next question is, what is this action potential? What is the signal that's flowing? So to show you that, I have a schematic nerve cell. It has a cell body. It has a nucleus. It has these little protrusions called dendrites that receive input, and it has a long process called the axon that then sends information to the next cell in line. <clears throat> and the standard currency of the nervous system is called the action potential or nerve spike. It's schematized here. It's a transitory change in the voltage across the membrane. And here's a picture of a nerve spike here. The, the voltage inside the cell starts out negative because of the resting potential. There's a transient positivity inside the cell, and then a reassertion of the negative signal inside the cell, and one is back where one started. And this whole electrical signal sweeps down the axon from one end to the other. What we have here is a picture, if we could make such a picture, of what would happen if we caught the thing in flight and asked what's going on at an instant in time. And in brief, the action potential stems from the activity of two types of ion channels. At the front end of the action potential, sodium channels are opening. Sodium is running into the cell and making the inside more positive. That's why the voltage goes up. At the back end of the action potential, potassium is going through different channels out of the cell. That removal of potassium makes the inside more negative and makes the voltage come back down again. So this is a signal that transmits along or flows along a nerve fiber without decrement. It doesn't fade out. It's just like a one or zero in a transatlantic cable. It zooms down the length of an axon as far as it goes, looking like this all along. The thing that makes it go is it's basically a self-catalyzed reaction. It's in some ways like a grass fire. So here again is the axon. Here is again the action potential moving to your left. When the action potential is at a given position, Ionic current, potassium ions, flow ahead of as well as behind this action potential. And the flow of current ahead of the action potential excites sodium channels ahead of it and causes the action potential to move ever forward, that is, ever to your left. And it's just like a grass fire. Here's a grass fire devouring grass and moving to your left. The thing that makes the, the fire go is heat. There's heat coming from the back of the fire and particularly heat rating from the front of the fire that brings the next chunk of the grass to the point of conflagration and then allows the fire to advance. And in both cases, after a signal has gone by, there's a temporary respite, a period of quiescence. It takes a while before the action potential is ready to fire a new spike. It takes a while before the grass grows back and another fire can f flow through. And as a consequence of this quiescent period, in fact, an action potential can occur about only every millisecond. There could be up to about 1,000 per second. So all our nerve signaling is done with a range from zero activity to about 1,000 spikes per second, and typically from a background rate of about 10 to about, say, 500 spikes per second. 
Now, I'm going to try to demonstrate this type of activity uh, using a simple preparation. That's a crayfish. It's a crayfish just of the sort that are used uh, in making various Cajun dishes, such as jambalaya or uh, popcorn shrimp or things of this sort. They're formed extensively across the South. And these animals have a number of legs, and they also have prominent pincers. In fact, <coughs> one has to be careful with them. Here's a typical example of one. Now, these animals, just like ourselves, have particular senses to deal with knowing where their limbs are. I've already mentioned that muscle spindles and Golgi tendon organs tell us where our, our limbs are in space and how much tension the muscles bear. The same with these guys. Their different joints measure where their limbs are in space. They're rather like robots. They can move around in various directions. And they also have detectors that can measure the tension that any one of their joints is producing. So we have in our preparation today a crayfish tail of the sort that's actually used in culinary dishes. And this crayfish tail has been placed into an electrode. So the nerve activity coming from the tail is going into this electrode. And if we're lucky, we'll be able to hear that nerve activity. So could I have the sound up, please? A little more, please? Louder? Thank you. So e that rumbling noise, each of those little pops, is a single action potential. And if we now look at this in the video, if we could bring that up, please, we'll be able to see on the oscilloscope the electrical activity as well. What I'm going to do then is to stimulate the tail of the animal by bending it back and forth. So there's the tail. And listen as I bend it back and forth. You hear the increased firing? Do you see extra spikes that are occurring? And you can see several characteristics of this. <clears throat> if I move the tail very slowly, we have slow rumbling and continuous firing. If I move it fast, we get faster firing. And if I move it and hold it, we'll get firing transiently, but then the system will adapt or quit firing. Watch. Okay, it fires while I'm moving it, but it quits firing when I quit moving it. So I might be making this up. I'd like somebody else to come up and try it. We need somebody who can thread a needle while riding a bicycle. Who's dexterous? Anybody down here in front? Feel lucky? OK, please come up. This is just to show you that this is an honest demonstration. So you've never seen me before, right? No, I haven't. Have you ever seen this crayfish before? No. OK. <laughs> Which way? Either way. And try what I mentioned. Try moving it and then holding it. See what happens. And then try wiggling it fast. So that gives a very strong response to jitter it back and forth so you get multiple responses. Terrific. Thanks. Thank you. You get one of these. This is a Jim Rockefeller University t-shirt. You can't. You can't buy it at any store. It's made of 100% cotton in the United States. Thank you. Okay. Put up the sound back down, please. Now, what you might have observed in that is that there is a dependency of the frequency or the rate of firing on how hard one is stimulating. And that's schematized here. If there's no stimulus at all, there's a certain background firing rate. If we give a unit stimulus, we wiggle the tail x far, we get a certain increase in the firing of the action potentials. If we go 10 times as far, we get more firing. 100 times as far, more firing still. And in general, there is an interesting relationship between how hard you stimulate and how much response you get. Namely, as you increase the stimulus 1, 10, 100 times, the response rises, but it rises much less than proportionately. It doesn't go up 10 or 100 times. It only goes up a couple of times. And for those of you who like logarithms, this can well be portrayed by plotting the size of the response against the logarithm of the stimulus strength. So the logarithm of 1 is 0. The logarithm of two is of 10 to the 2, or 100, is, is uh, Sorry, let's try that again. One unit has a log 0, 10 units has log 1, 100 units has log 2. And we get a straight line relationship between these two variables. 
In fact, this is called the Weber-Fechner relationship, a logarithmic relationship between stimulus input uh, and the output, and it's given by this particular number down here, or this, sorry, this equation, but we don't need to worry about the particulars. The neat thing about this relationship is the following. It gives inordinate representation to small stimuli. We get a big response in proportion to changes around the threshold, the very faintest stimuli we can perceive. But we get proportionally smaller responses as the stimulus gets larger and larger. And that's useful behaviorally. What matters to us is hearing a tiger in the bushes or whatever when it's very faint. You don't particularly care about nuances when the tiger is almost upon you. A very loud tiger or a terribly loud tiger is pretty much the same thing. You want to be able to detect the thing when it's still off some distance away. One last feature of this responsiveness you heard with the crayfish's tail, and that's called adaptation. Often, we will respond best to changes in the stimulus as opposed to a continuing stimulus, and that again makes behavioral sense. We care about things that are changing in the environment, not constants. And there's a nice example of that called the Pacinian corpuscle. This is the kind of receptor that's found in certain portions of the body, such as the intestine, and some of the corpuscles found in your fingers that are sensitive to, to pressure or to vibration. Each of these consists of the end of a nerve fiber surrounded by an onion-like wrapping of connective tissue. And this shows strong adaptation. If you squeeze it with this little probe here, you find that there's a burst of spikes, but then adaptation. The reason that they do so turns out to be mechanical. If you strip away the onion and apply a force directly to the nerve, as long as you push, the firing rate keeps up. So the nerve stays equally sensitive. What ordinarily happens, though, is when you apply a force, that force is initially transmitted through the flexible onion-like material and crushes the nerve. But as time goes on, the onion-like material redistributes and takes the pressure off the nerve, allowing relaxation to occur. There are many different types of adaptation, but as I emphasize, they're all useful for the same thing, namely for making us most sensitive to changes in stimulation as opposed to ongoing stimuli. The last point to be made is the way in which information is relayed from the sensory receptor cells to other cells of the brain. And that's done by synapses. A nerve cell, and this is an arbitrary nerve cell from the cerebellum, sends an axon out, and that axon with one or more branches embraces various other so-called postsynaptic cells to which the action potential is going to flow and which are going to be excited by it. And at the contact site between two cells, there are certain synaptic specializations. The presynaptic cell, the one that's first excited, typically has in it little bags of a neurotransmitter substance. These are called vesicles. And when this first cell is excited and has an action potential in it, these vesicles fuse, as this one is doing, letting the chemical substance inside spill out. It diffuses down and chemically excites this postsynaptic cell, sending information on into the brain. This sort of signaling is found in all our sensory receptors. In some cases, such as the olfactory neuron that I've already shown you, or the photoreceptor cell that you'll hear about in half an hour from Dr. Nathans, the cell has an axon of one length or another, at the end of which the synapse sends a signal to the postsynaptic neuron. In other cases, the sensory receptor cell itself makes a synapse at its base directly onto a nerve fiber that then carries the information all the way. This is found with the taste receptor and also with the hair cell that you'll see tomorrow. So the point that I hope to have made in this talk is to give you an idea of the fact that all these sensory receptors function in a somewhat similar way. They all are dealing with common problems. They all come up with similar solutions. And as I've mentioned, we'll consider these strategies in much more detail while talking about the two senses of greatest interest to us, vision in the next lecture, and hearing in the lecture after that. And at this point, I'd like to use the last few minutes to take questions from the audience. We have more valuable t-shirts if you need stimulus. Who has a good, who's got a question? <laughs> Sir. So that's an, another general feature of senses. You ask what is the effect of temperature on, on the microvilli of a taste bud. In general, each sensory system tries to be as insensitive as possible to irrelevant stimuli. It is the case that if you heat a taste bud too much with a match or something, you would taste something, right? It would finally excite the cells, possibly even damage them, but heat is an irrelevant stimulus. So the ears typically don't respond to light, the eyes don't respond to sound, et cetera, et cetera, because in effect, each of them has been tuned to make it minimally sensitive to an inappropriate stimulus. Sir. Sure. 
Okay, so this is an enormous area of interest. The question is, why is it, if, if you didn't all hear it, why is it that some neurons, some nerve cells of the brain, are capable of being replaced, or that other nerve cells can take the place of a damaged cell, whereas it's not so in others? And this is a, a, an important area of investigation right now, because precisely we don't know the answer to that. There are some cells that are ordinarily turning over in the brain all the time. The olfactory neurons that I mentioned to you typically live a few weeks, die, and are then replaced by other like neurons. But of course, for most of our central nervous system, a dead neuron is not replaceable. Once it's gone, it's gone for good. So one of the things that many uh, researchers are now trying to do is to ferret out the signals that are involved in this process. There are so-called uh, mitotic signals that tell cells that they should divide. We'd like to find out what those signals are so that we could make new nerve cells to replace dead ones. They're so-called trophic substances, chemical substances that sustain nerve fibers alive. We'd like to decode those so that we can keep cells alive or replace damaged cells with new ones. Other questions? Yes? You said that amplification was energy over work. Is yes. that the basis for um, hearing aids? So amplification in general is just the ratio between the amount of energy that comes out of a system and the amount of energy that goes in. So if we're talking about amplification, for example, in the case of this demonstration, we have a certain small amount of electrical energy going in here. We said that the action potential is about 100 millivolts in amplitude. But the signal that comes out that we finally hear over the loudspeaker has been magnified some tens of millions of times, so there's enough energy in it for it, us to hear that. So this is going to be a very general phenomenon of amplification throughout the nervous system. Maybe that doesn't answer the question quite. Well, saying if you supply more energy, as in with like a device, then does that like have certain uh, devices work? Yes, it, yeah, quite so. So if your sensory system is somehow slightly deficient, for example, if your hearing is not up to snuff, you can then add before your sensory receptors an additional amplifier. So it would be like having an amplification device if the crayfish needed it that would augment the size of the mechanical stimulus supplied to it. And we'll see tomorrow that that's somewhat the way, in fact, that uh, hearing aids and cochlear prostheses, the so-called artificial ears, operate. I don't know if I can get this that far. Yes? But can you taste, um, can you sense every taste on each taste button? No. So in fact, you can do that experiment yourself. If you take a Q-tip or something like that, preferably a clean one, and dip it in different substances, in lemon juice or in something that's bitter, like quinine or something like that, and then apply it to different parts of the tongue, you'll find, in fact, that there are discrete regions of the tongue that are sensitive to salt and to sour and to sweet and to bitter. I don't remember which is which, but there are different locales with different sensitivities. And that, in fact, then reflects the fact that different taste cells are going to be occurring in taste buds on different papillae over the tongue's surface. Something from over here? Other people, sir. Yes, uh, and scientifically, how much attention is paid to uh, sensory such as instinct and uh, maybe even telekinesis? Uh, I would say, first of all, those instinct I wouldn't call really a, a sense, right? I mean, instinct is a, a built-in set of programs in the nervous system that are involved in interpreting sensory input. So, for example, the male moths flying upwind trying to find the female moth in, involves using built-in programs that are genetically determined in that animal's nervous system, using the se sensory information and carrying out a particular program. As far as things like telekinesis are concerned, people have done experiments again and again in areas like that. The problem is finding consistent results that can be replicated in blind circumstances. And I think you know what a blind experiment is, an experiment in which the experimental subject doesn't know what the right answer should be. So when people have tried to use telekinesis or tried to use telepathy or things of this sort under control circumstances, again and again the results have been negative. So people go on looking for it, but they have not found it. Yes? Um, are the molecules that pick up certain tastes, such as artificial, artificial sweeteners, are they present when we're born, or do they kind of develop as you grow? Uh, as far as I know, the, the taste, receptive substance, uh, taste receptive molecules are largely present throughout life. It is true that young kids do seem to have, uh, neonates, newborn infants, do seem to have different taste pres uh, preferences than adults. And so I don't know if there is some change with time. There are also interesting relations between those different taste receptive molecules and food preferences. So for those of you who could taste the PT, P, 
PC, the sour, awful taste, and who also interpreted the benzoate as being salty, people of that stripe typically like spinach, buttermilk, turnips, and other things that adults don't eat. Uh, it's a particular concatenation of flavors that th people with those two sets of receptors like more than other people like. Others, yes? Uh, how does like the bionate axons, they like increase the speed of transmission, but how does the, the signal jump from the nose to the ear? Okay, so uh, this gentleman is talking about something called a myelinated axon. A myelinated axon is a, a special kind of axon. This will probably get me in trouble with the TV crew, but anyway, they have a lot more where this came from. Um, the, the axon that I've showed you is one in which the sodium channels and the potassium channels occur everywhere. So each little increment becomes excited in turn, causing the electrical signal to gradually move along. Okay? In the case of a myelinated nerve fiber, there is an insulator, a fatty wrapping called myelin, that covers large chunks of the system. So what happens now is the action potential is sitting at this point, and it then spreads rather quickly from here to this point and excites it, and then it spreads through the next inner node, the next chunk of myelin to the next one, and so on. The way in which it spreads, though, is just the same as what I showed you before. Namely, it's the flow of current down the axon that makes the thing uh, uh, efficient and makes, makes the uh, action potential move forward. So if one took the analogy of the grass fire, it would be as though you had something that propagated the heat well in front of the grass. Let's suppose you had an iron rod or something like that sitting there. The grass at one point would heat the iron rod. That signal would then move quickly to the other end of the iron rod and set the grass aflame down there. That's basically the way myelin works. And I should say that this broadcast is brought to you by mostly myelinated nerve fibers. All of our fast activities, these movements, this knee jerk, and so on, involve myelinated nerve fibers that carry action potentials as fast as 100 or even 120 meters per second. The unmyelinated fibers of the sort that I showed you are found in our slow systems, like our sensitivity to pain or to heat, and found in animals like crayfish that don't yet have the advantage of having myelin. So I can take one more question. Yes? Do nerve cells that are reproduced, do they enter the G sub zero phase or do they just go through a normal phase and then die out normally? The, w the ones that do reproduce or the ones that don't reproduce? I didn't know. The ones that, that do reproduce, exactly, go through an entirely normal cell cycle. So the same sort of cycles that as a liver cell or anything else goes through. Other nerve cells uh, can arrest in either of the classical arrest phases, uh, for those of you who know about cell cycles. Some nerve cells actually go ahead and duplicate their DNA, so they have four copies instead of two copies. That presumably helps these very large cells uh, carry out their biochemical functions. Because remember, some of these cells are quite enormous. A nerve cell here in the spinal cord can be as long as a meter, reaching all the way down to make this toe wiggle. So I'll stop at that point. I'd like to thank you all and uh, ask Dr. Chopin to take over. <laughs>